Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. How are we doing church? Feeling awake? Feeling alive? Yeah, you guys are way, I love second service, y'all. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, you guys always got way more energy than first service. So, uh, hey, so glad to have you here today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rob Williams, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridge. And uh, we just want to welcome you to our family. Something um, that I like to say is when, we, when you walk into the Bridge, we want you to feel like you're at Mama's house, okay? Now, how many of you grew up in a house where it's like, hey, whenever your friends came over, it's like the fridge is open, mi casa es su casa, make yourself at home. Anybody grow up in a house like that? Yeah, so like in our house, my mom taught me something. We've got something called a drink fridge, okay? Now, I'm not talking about that kind of drink fridge, okay? I'm talking about it's always full of soda and pop and water, and it's like, hey, you know where the fridge is. Don't you dare ask if you want to get something. Just go get it, okay? Uh, if you're new with us, we want you to feel like that. We want you to feel like you can be at home here, and um, uh, we're happy to have you. And uh, man, we pray God blesses you through the service today. I know I've already been blessed through the worship music. Amen? Amen? Okay, if I can talk today. All right, good stuff. Well, guys, today we're going to be uh, in week four of our series on the book of Matthew. And if you've been with us, we're going to do a little bit of review for those of you that haven't. But if you've been with us, you know that today we're jumping into Matthew chapter four. Okay, so if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead and turn there now. Okay, if you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, grab one of the black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. We're going to read through the whole passage of scripture in the NIV. Um, we're going to read through the whole chapter and then we're going to break down just a small portion of it. Um, um, but we just want you soaking in the Word of God every single week, and so we're excited to get into it with you. Um, if you're joining us online, man, we're so glad you're with us. We're so glad you're joining us online. However, we want to encourage you to make sure you do everything you can to find a church home, to get um, in person with people. I heard one pastor say this week, you don't need to go to church because you need a message. You go to church because you need a hug. Amen? Yeah, you need a hug, and church is about community, so if you're joining us online, man, we're so glad you're joining us, but we hope you can find a church home wherever, you at, if, wherever you're at. So if you're here in Floyd County, man, we'd love you to see you here in person at the bridge, but um, if you're somewhere else, man, we hope you find a church home uh, uh, wherever you're at that you can be in community with. However, if you are watching and you don't have a Bible with you, we want you to encourage, want to encourage you to download an app called YouVersion, that's Y-O-U version, and it's a great way to read scripture and share it with others, okay? And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 today, and we're we're going to dive right in, but before we do that, I want to kind of share with you why I'm so excited to be able to preach today, because today, Pastor Rob gets to preach from the overflow. From the what? The overflow, okay? The overflow is like, hey, I've been drinking this so much. I've been studying this so much. I've just, I've had this so f full in me that, man, I'm just going to spill it all over y'all. Does that sound good? Okay, because today, today, we're going to be talking about fishing, y'all. Everybody look at your, look at your neighbor and say, fishing. Fishing. It's going to be so good. Uh, fishing is, for those of you that know me, you know I'm an avid fisherman. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the first analogies Jesus ever used in Scripture when he, set, when, when he called the disciples, the first analogy he used was that of fishing. That's right. All right. So why don't we do this? We're going to dig into the word right away. We're going to, we're, we're just going to soak in the word of God this morning, break it down a little bit, and then we're going to step in and really talk about what the message is about today. Okay. So Matthew chapter one, starting in verse one, it says this, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, the devil himself. Okay, now it says then, which means there was something before. Okay, if you were with us last week, you remember that in chapter three of Matthew, Jesus was um, baptized by who? John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptizer, right? So all throughout Matthew chapter three, you see the story of John the Baptist who was uh, uh, literally born by God in order to prepare a way for Jesus, okay? And then we step into chapter four. Where now Jesus has been baptized, okay? How would you like to be the guy baptizing Jesus, right? That'd be crazy. And, and now we step into chapter four and right away, Jesus goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan himself. Okay, so just that's the context that we're in right now. Jesus' ministry hasn't even started yet, okay? 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, which makes sense, right? If you hadn't eaten for 40 days, 40 nights, you'd be hungry too. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I find it kind of hilarious and also ironic that in this passage he says, man shall not live on bread alone, but every mouth that comes from the word of God, as he's quoting scripture, which is words from the mouth of God. Okay, we're moving on. All right, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. The holy city would be Jerusalem. Okay. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that they will not strike your foot against, so that you will not strike your strike your foot against stone. So Jesus says, man must live on every word from the mouth of God. So Satan's like, "Oh no, don't worry. I got some word for you," right? And so he actually quotes scripture here. Satan's not taking scripture, um, uh, isn't misquoting scripture here. He's taking it out of context, but he's, he's quoting, he's like, all right, if you want to throw scripture at me, I'll throw scripture at you. I don't know if you know this, but the devil knows scripture. He knows it better, better than you do, probably. He was an angel before he fell from heaven, right? And so, so he quotes scripture, but then Jesus answers. He says, no, 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 you got to read the whole Bible, because then you, then you would understand that it also is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test, Verse 8, again, the devil took him away to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is also written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels attended to him. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I first dove into the passage this week or the chapter this week, this was the passage I was going to preach on. I was like, man, that would be such a sweet passage to, to break down and pull apart. But then I kind of felt led another direction. But as I was doing research uh, in this passage, uh, man, the thing that stood out to me most were the three different temptations and how different they all were, right? And I actually found in an article that the, the, the way we, a really unique way that we can differentiate the three different temptations, okay? You see, say, the first thing that Satan did was he t- tempted Jesus with his appetite, right? Literally his appetite. Then he tempted him with applause, okay? Otherwise, uh, other, or otherwise known as the attention of man or the attention of angels, okay? And then the last thing he attempted him with was authority, okay? So G, G, Satan went after Jesus o- over his appetite, his attention, and his authority, okay? Now let me break these down for you. Many of us are given over to our appetites, aren't we, right? Whether it's actually food or it's a sexual desire, or we have an appetite for something that's unhealthy for us, like an addiction, or, or, or something that we shouldn't be having, that we know we shouldn't be having, that we know that's not good for us, but for some reason we still want it, right? There are so many things that are coming after your appetite, and the enemy will tempt you, just like he did Jesus, to, to, to give in to your cravings, give in to the flesh, right? But we don't live by the flesh. What do we live by? The Spirit, by the Spirit. And the Spirit desires what is contrary. Everybody say contrary. Contrary to the flesh, right? But then the second thing that, that Satan kind of tempts us with um, is the applause, okay? Is appetite and applause, otherwise attention, okay? So he, he told Jesus, he said, hey, get up on top of this temple and throw yourself off and, and the, the angels will give you attention. They will save you. They will lift you up. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Do not put your Lord God to the test. And I don't know about you, but I kind of very much in a, in a very big way see how our society is being tempted to get attention. Would you, would you agree? There, there's these two powerful words that everybody knows about called social media, right? Social media is all about attention. How many likes can I get? How many of you caught yourself like, ooh, I wonder how many comments I get, right? Like, I wonder how many comments I got on that post. Or as you're writing the post, you're like, oh, I know I'm going to get some likes on this one, right? I, I'm saying that because I've done it, okay? I'm, I'm that bad, okay? So w- Satan's trying to get you to crave the attention of others, okay? And to put too much into the attention of others. And then we get to the last part. And this is probably the most convicting one, and that is authority and or control, right? Satan says, hey, if you worship me, if you'll, just, if you'll just give yourself over to me, man, I will give you authority over all that you see in, in front of you, all of the kingdoms of the earth. But Jesus says, no, I will worship my God and my God alone. He says, not my will be done, but yours, O Lord. Can I just openly confess to you right now that 
some of my worst moments as a pastor, some of my worst moments as a husband, my worst moments as a father have been when I think that I'm in control. When I think I've got it all together, when I think I've got it all just wrapped up in a tight little ball by myself. As a matter of fact, in my testimony, the time that I gave my life to Jesus for the very first time, I thought I had control and I was just going to do what I wanted and go where I wanted. And, and, and I had these two different lives that I was living and the lies that ended up running into each other. And eventually I had to come to a point where I had to say, no, 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 this is out of control. I thought I was in control, but I'm really out of control. And Lord, I need you to take control. Some of you were here this morning, and, and if you were honest, you've been trying to control everything. And you think you're in control, but when it really comes down to it, you are out of control, and God is calling on you. He's calling on you to give him authority over your life. He's calling you to worship him and him alone. Satan will go after your appetite. He will go after your, the attention that you crave, and he will go after the authority that God wants in your life. Okay, that'll preach. Let's go home. All right, ready? Worship team, come back up. No, we're good. Okay, we're going to keep going. All right? Verse 12. Let's keep preaching. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in, uh, in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. There's all these prophecies about Jesus all throughout Scripture, and he's constantly fulfilling them. And you'll see that all throughout the book of Matthew. This is something that's unique about Matthew, is he's very, very well steeped in prophecy and Scripture, and he's always trying to show you, hey, this is the real Messiah, this is the real Messiah, this is the real Messiah, Right? And so we read from a passage um, of Scripture that is actually a prophecy about Jesus. And it says, Land of Zebulon, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Who is? Jesus. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. His name is Jesus. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach some very familiar words, if you were with us last week, that John the Baptist began preaching in his ministry. And that was what? Repent for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then, as he's beginning his ministry, Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will teach you, I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Everybody say, at once. When God tells you to do something, you do it. You don't hesitate. Amen? Amen. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately, immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread, throughout, uh, spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So Jesus is tempted in the desert. And immediately after he spends all this time with Satan, right, the first thing he does is he begins his ministry and he says, no, the most important thing I can do is go after the lost. And I want you to hold on to that. The most important thing I can do is go after the lost. And he begins to model what his ministry will be, the same ministry that John the Baptist modeled when he said what? Let's read this together. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then, and then he calls his first disciples. So he models running after the lost, and then he goes and calls disciples to do the same. And he says, one of my favorite phrases within all of Scripture, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Or as it says here, I will send you out to fish 
for men. Now, just to review, if you haven't been with us, in Matthew chapter 1, okay, we jumped into this genealogy of Jesus. And many of us, when we get into the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, we kind of skip over it because we've seen all the census in the Old Testament, and there's all these kinds of different names, and she was the father of him, and he was the father of him, and all this stuff, right? And you kind of go through this crazy gene- genealogy, but, but, but really what that chapter is all about is God's plan, And God's got a plan, and you need to know that. And that's what's really, really important that we don't miss, is that God's got a plan. He's got a a plan for this world. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. The question is whether or not we want to surrender ourselves over to him that we might be in his plan, be a part of his plan. Now, the second second week we jumped into Matthew chapter 2, and we talked about the fact that his plan calls for radical obedience, okay? Meaning that... We are going to look different as followers of Jesus than the rest of the world. And I don't know if you know this, but if you live in the Western world, which if you live in the United States, you live in the Western world, okay? The Western world's looking further and further and further away from what Jesus looked like, isn't it? Yeah. Right? In other words, in other words, the simplest obedience to Jesus is going to look like radical obedience to the world in a lot of ways. It's going to take a lot of courage. It's going to take a lot of faith. It's going to take a lot of perseverance to be radically obedient to who God has called you to be. You see, this is what's important to Jesus. And that's modeled through his father, Joseph, and it's modeled in the life of Jesus himself. And then he calls the, the disciples to radical obedience, and at once they followed him. I think that's why he called them, because he knew that they would obey him immediately. I thought that was so unique. But not only that, Jesus doesn't just find radical obedience to be important. The second thing that he calls us to is radical repentance, which is what we see John start the ministry of last week. In Matthew chapter 3, we see his message throughout his entire ministry was repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized because the kingdom of heaven is near. And then Jesus carries that on in Matthew chapter 4. And after that, we also see that Jesus' plan, God's plan for us, calls us to go fishing, okay? And this is why I'm so excited about talking about this passage today, because Pastor Rob is an avid fisherman, and I think there's a lot of things that we can learn as it pertains to the analogy of fishing, as well as it pertains to the, what it means to be fishers of men, okay? Um, Jesus doesn't call us to be saved. He calls us to be saved and then help others do the same, Amen. He calls us to be used by God to expand his kingdom, to bring heaven on earth, to be his light to a dark, broken, depressed, and angry world. And man, we live in an angry world, don't we? He calls us to be salt and light in a world of bitterness and darkness. He calls us to be his hands and his feet. The problem is, the problem is, is that many of us are really afraid of that mission, A lot of us feel pretty ill-equipped as it pertains to being fishers of men. A lot of us are scared because we don't understand what it actually means to share our faith with others. And not only that, the problem, especially within our Western world, is that instead of being fishers of men, we've become keepers of an aquarium. Keith Loy said this, a pastor up at Celebrate Church in Sioux Falls. He He said, too often churches become keepers of aquariums rather than fishers of men. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Many of you here today, not all of you, but many of you are here and you came from another church. You were already, you'd already given your life to Jesus and you, had just, you just decided it was time to move somewhere else and to go somewhere else. And I'm not condemning you for that. We're glad you're here. We want you here. I just had a conversation with a guy this week, had coffee with a guy this week. And I said, hey man, you've been a follower of Jesus for 20 years. So if you're going to come to the bridge, it's time to get to work. Amen. It's time to get to work because, because Jesus, the very first thing he called the disciples to do was go fishing. It's not about just praying a prayer and getting that golden ticket like you did in Sunday school when you were a kid. It's about more than just that. God's got bigger plans for you. As a matter of fact, this is our greatest purpose. Now, why is it our greatest purpose? Because it was Jesus' greatest purpose. It was Jesus' greatest purpose. Jesus, the the thing he was most concerned about throughout his entire ministry were who? The lost. As a matter of fact, in Luke it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, right? 
And then one of my favorite passages in Mark, you can see this all throughout his ministry, but I'm going to just share a few passages with you today. In Mark, you see him say this. this is one of my favorite passages. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, Jesus says. It is the who? Sick. Eric? Sick. Yep. It's the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We, that's why here at the bridge we say, come as you are. You don't, you don't got to clean up to come to church. You don't got to do that. Come as you are. Just do us a favor and do yourself a favor. Don't leave the same. Because Jesus has got a lot more for you than to just show up mucky and leave messy. He wants you to show up and leave cleansed. Amen? He wants you to leave clean. He wants you to leave free. He wants you to leave, you, you, you to leave set free. That weight that you brought in this morning, don't you take it home with you. God's got something bigger that he wants to do with it. And then, Near the end of Jesus' ministry, after he rises from the dead, he says this, when Jesus, when Jesus came to them, he said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, therefore, what? Go. Everybody say go. 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 Get on out. I don't want you to stay here. I don't want you to keep this to yourself. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, a lot of us like to pay attention to that first half. That first half's really good, right? Like, hey, get them saved, get them baptized, they'll have that golden ticket, get them ready to go. No, 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 no. That's the first half of the gospel. We gotta talk about the second half too. We gotta teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, let me start with something here. Um, As a parent, one of the things that I've learned is this, it's better that I model than I simply teach. So let me ask you a question as it pertains to the Great Commission. That's what this is, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is a Great Commission. How great are you at modeling the obedience of the Lord and everything he's called you to? You want your kids to know Jesus? You better obey him yourself. You better show them what the fruits of the Spirit are yourself. You better do everything you can to step into radical obedience and radical repentance so that your children might model the same. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he says this, he says, surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. But that's not it. That's not even the last thing that Jesus said to them. Because then we go to the book of Acts. And just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, listen, you need to wait. You need to wait on who? Does anybody know? The Holy Spirit, right? He says, you need to wait on the Holy Spirit. But when you do that, when he comes down on you, you will receive power and you will be my what? My witnesses. In other words, you will be my plan A. You will be the ones that tell others about who I am and what I've done. So that people in Charles City, Iowa might be sitting in blue chairs at the Bridge Church on March, what's the 19th of 2023, worshiping God just like you guys are. You will be my witnesses in, in, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Fishing, sharing the good news, being salt and light to this world that this world might come to know Christ was the most important thing God ever called us to because it was the most important thing he ever did. And it should be important to us because it was important to him. You see, God is distracted by lost people. Did you know that? He's absolutely distracted by lost people. If you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter 15. Just write that down. And, and this week, I want, you to, I want you to just read that chapter, Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, you see these stories of all of these, these um, uh, people that are, are distracted by lost things, Right? The first story you're going to come across is the story of the lost sheep, right? Many of us know this quote. He left the 99 sheep to go after the one. He is the good shepherd. Yeah, it's great. I got my 99 sheep, but I know that one's over there, and I'm going to go get him. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get him back. I'm going for the lost sheep. Then you come to story number two in Luke chapter 15. Story number two, there's this woman who has 10 coins, but she's lost one, right? Right? Ladies, have you ever turned your house upside down looking for something? Men, you ever turned the house upside down looking for the one remote? Come on now. Right? She flipped the whole house upside down to find that one coin. Yeah, she had those nine, and that was great. Listen, we got all these people in this room. This is great, right? Like, this is great. Look at your neighbor and say, man, this is great. But then look at all the lost seats that are empty right now. Look at all the seats that are empty right now and go, 
man, I need to be more obsessed with that. Because those seats represent those that aren't here. In church on Sunday, we get so concerned about seeing our friends and connecting with our friends and, and hearing the message. Man, I hope the worship music's good. But, but what would happen if we became a church that was more concerned about the seats that weren't filled on a Sunday morning? That were distracted by the loss like Jesus and God are distracted by them. You come to the last story in that passage and you see the story of the prodigal son. You guys know that story? See a few heads nodding. Prodigal son, there's a story of this master and he's got two sons and one son's just got it all together, sort of. He's being obedient to his father and he's doing everything he can to honor his dad. But then there's this other son, the lost son, the one who just cares all about himself. And he makes all these mistakes and he does all these stupid things and, and, and he ends up finding himself in the muck, as a matter of fact, the literal muck of a pig's pen. And he realizes, you know what, kind of what I realized earlier, I thought I had control of this thing, but really I'm out of control, and I just need to go back home and be a slave. He doesn't even, want, he doesn't even feel worthy to be a son again. He's like, I just want to be a slave, and what happens? He, he goes back home, and his father sees him in the distance, and he runs at him with all he's got. And he embraces the son with open arms in the most intimate of ways between a father and son and said, it's time to celebrate. Because what was once lost is now found. And he throws a feast. Why? Because, because God is distracted by the lost and he is passionate for the lost. And every soul that comes to know him, he could not be more ecstatic to embrace in his loving arms. Amen? Notice this. Jesus' first words to his disciples were, come, follow me, and I will teach you to fish for men. And his last words where you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. His first words were, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then in the book of Acts, we see him tell the disciples his last words that essentially said, now it's time to go fishing. Usually in a, in a movie or a book, the most important things for you to understand the context of everything that's happened are the beginning and the end, aren't they? I need to know how it started so I could, because I'm not going to understand the middle if I don't. And I need to know how, it, how, how it's going to end or I'm going to go crazy. And Jesus, in the beginning and the end, says, Listen, this is what it's all about fishing for men, running after those that don't know. Jesus, the problem is we're afraid of that purpose for a number of different reasons. And today what I want to do is I want to begin to equip you. Everybody say begin. I want to begin to equip you with some lessons learned that I've been given and some things that I've been given as, um, as a fisherman and a fisher of men, okay, that I think correlate between the two that, that will allow us to understand how difficult but also awesome it can be to fish for men. Okay? So this is what I want to do today. I want to teach you some lessons that I've learned in fishing. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take these lessons and we're going to correlate them to what it means to, to share the gospel with others and really step into what God has called us to as a family. Okay? Um, the first lesson that I ever learned in fishing was this. It was, it was that it's going to be, comfort it would be uncomfortable at first. Okay? It's going to be uncomfortable. And none of us likes to be uncomfortable, but none of us grow when we're comfortable. Let me say that again. None of us likes to be uncomfortable, but none of us grow when we're comfortable. You hear what I'm saying? Now, when I first started fishing, my grandfather, uh, my grandpa Frank, who just passed a couple months ago, um, took me fishing. And my grandpa Frank really didn't know a ton about fishing, but he knew enough to be dangerous, okay? And every time I went with my grandpa Frank, uh, <clears throat> we would just go out to the lake or, or, or the river, and we'd sit on the bank. He usually had a bucket he sat on, okay? He was a very simple man. And he gave me one of these things called a closed reel pole, okay? And uh, you can, I, I left the cobwebs and everything on it just to illustrate how much I don't use this thing, Okay? anymore because I've grown. I've moved on. I've, I, I, this is no longer uncomfortable for me, right? And so uh, uh, 
we, what we would do is he'd give me a bobber and a worm, and he, we'd throw the line out in the water, and then we'd just sit for the next three hours and wait for something to bite, right? And I'll be honest with you, this kind of fishing was really simple for me and not, not the most exciting, okay? As a matter of fact, I didn't really fall in love with fishing doing this. I did it with my grandpa for a little bit, and I really wasn't crazy about it, and I didn't really get into the hobby of fishing very much. But then, as I grew and as I got older, I started to learn how to use other rods and reels. Now, um, this is a combo I literally just got over the last few months, okay? Um, uh, This is, uh, my wife bought me this reel for Christmas, and of course I had to buy a new rod to go with it, right? I mean, come on. So uh, this is is one of my favorite brands. It's called the Guggen Squad, okay? It's one of my favorite fishing brands, and uh, this is a little bit more pricey than that one was, okay? Um, But this is an open face reel, okay? And I've got some pictures if you want to go to that open face reel there. Uh, Tyler, that would be awesome, man. Um, I, uh, this is an open face reel, and if, if you notice, the other reel kind of just had a button. You just push the button, and you cast it, and you let go of that button, and that's as simple as it gets, right? It's, it's probably, I haven't used a pole like that since I was in like third grade, you know what I'm saying? But then you get to the open face, and now it gets a little bit more complicated, because now you've got to feel the line with your finger, now you've got to control the line, you've got to open your bail and toss it out correctly and let go of that line, and when I first started doing this, I used to cast with two hands and let go of the line like that, but then I learned you can actually cast with one hand, just open your bail and toss it out and let go like that, and it just got a little bit more complicated, Right? And, and, and as I kept going, as I kept working through uh, uh, these different reels, I eventually, by the time I got older, I, I graduated to something called a baitcaster, okay? And uh, this was probably the most uncomfortable reel I've ever used in my life, okay? And the reason I say that, if you see the picture on the screen, is because this is a really finicky reel to use, okay? So it kind of looks like a closed reel from this side, right? But then if you turn it like this, you can see the line right there. It's got an open spool. You guys see that? Okay, now, what makes these so finicky? What is so difficult about using a bait casting reel? Well, um, these things are actually run by a magnet, okay, believe it or not. So you push a button just like your closed reel, but you control the spool with your thumb, and when you cast it out, you let go of that spool, and then this magnet controls how fast that spool goes, okay, and how, how fast it lets out the line. And if you have that magnet set improperly or just wrong instead of just right, it does something called overspooling, okay? You see that big old, this is something we call a rat's nest in fishing, okay? And if you get a rat's nest, you're going to be busy for at least the next five minutes pulling that thing out, okay? Unless you're really good at getting a rat's nest out, okay? Now, the first time I ever learned how to use a baitcaster um, was with my buddy Derek Dutton down in Des Moines. And uh, uh, he had been fishing his entire life. And I had only been fishing with my grandfather and a few other people, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and uh, he said, I'll take you out on the boat. I'll show you the ropes. It'll be awesome. I was like, all right, I'll bring my fishing poles. He's like, you're not going to need them. Well, being the prideful guy that I am, guys, you know what I'm talking about. I brought my poles anyway, okay? <laughs> I brought my poles. I brought my junky closed reel pole, my junky open reel pole. And eventually I got to the point where I, was, uh, 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 I, I, I pulled those things out and I was using them for about the first five minutes. And he just shook his head and he said, Rob, put those away. And then he handed me one of these. And over the next three or four hours, I probably got about 17 or 18 of those different rat's nests. And I felt so uncomfortable and so bad because I, not only did I get a rat's nest, but I didn't know how to pull them out. So guess who get, had to stop fishing when I had to stop fishing? Derek, right? Derek had to stop fishing when I stopped fishing. And it was so uncomfortable. It was so absolutely uncomfortable. But let me tell you this. The longer I did it, the more I kept at it, the harder I worked at it, the better I got and the more comfortable I became the more comfortable I became. I understand that for many of us this morning, when it comes to fishing for men, it can be really uncomfortable. How do you tell somebody about Jesus? How do you share your faith? I don't know scripture enough to do that. I don't know. Man, that's, that's not going to be easy for me to do. And I'm going to give you some, some tips near the end of the service to get you started. Everybody say, get you started. Okay? I said begin earlier, and now we're saying get you started. Okay? Okay. Um, but I'm just going to let you know now, it's going to be uncomfortable. Now, Isaac got on me because last service I didn't go to the fourth rod and reel, and I don't want everybody to get distracted. So this is a fly rod, okay? This is for fly fishing. Um, I literally, I'm telling you as I speak, I don't know how to use this thing, okay? <laughs> my wife just got me this for my birthday because she's amazing. Uh, all of my nicest rods and reels that I own uh, were bought by my wife because she's my sugar mama, okay? And... Uh, And this summer, guess what Rob's going to do? Rob's going to get uncomfortable. And he's going to learn how to do something new. And and I'm excited about it. 
and I can't wait to see the awesome adventures I'm going to go on because I'm, I'm going to try something that I'm not used to doing. Okay? So lesson number one when it comes to fishing, whether you're fishing on the water or fishing for men, it's going to be uncomfortable. Okay? But then number two, the, most, uh, the second one is that you're going to make mistakes. Okay? Now, I've got about a million mistakes I can share with you as it pertains to fishing, but I'm just going to share one with you today, okay? Um, and that is this. A couple years ago, my wife and I were uh, getting ready to take the kids fishing, and we were really excited to get on the water, but we had, we had to go in later in the day, and so we're losing daylight, and we're kind of in a rush, and so we go up to Silver Lake and Lake Mills, which is about an hour, 15 minutes away, and we're getting ready to go bass fishing, which is my favorite kind of fishing, and I can't wait to get on the water, and we, sure enough, uh, we get there, and we're losing daylight, and, and we've got four kids with us, which is crazy, y'all, okay? Four kids, 12 and in the boat, um, it, that's a recipe for disaster. But otherwise, I'm like, all right, let's get on the water. And, I, and But we get there, and I'm like, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. we should probably have the kids go to the bathroom first, because otherwise, I'm going to be hanging them off the side of the boat. I'm not coming back in, honey. It ain't happening, okay? So so we get, a, we, we get to the lake, and I tell my wife, I'm like, all right, you go to the bathroom with the kids, I'll go launch the boat, and then by the time they're going done, done going to the bathroom, we'll already be on the water. She's like, all right, sounds good. Let's do it. And so sure enough, what we do is we, well, I drop the kids off, I go over, and I back the boat in, which I, I can back a boat with my eyes closed because I, I, I was a truck driver for five years, and, and, and I start unhooking all the straps, and I'm really excited, getting ready to go, and I'm like, shoot, I don't have anybody to hold onto the rope when the boat comes off the trailer, right? I'm like, ah, oh, it'll be all right. So I hop in my car, and my, my objective was I'm just going to I'm just gonna nudge it off the trailer. It's going to slowly float, maybe bump into the dock. I'll go and grab it, and I'll tie it off, right? So sure enough, I hop in my SUV, and I put it in reverse, and I hit the gas a little bit and give it a little, just a nice little nudge, right? Boom. The, trailer, the, the boat goes nowhere. Just stays on the trailer. Doesn't even move, okay? And then the second time, uh, I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to give it a little more. So I pull forward, and then I put it in reverse, and I, sure enough, I go back, and I hit the brakes a little bit harder. Boom! Doesn't budge. And so at this point, I'm frustrated. We're losing daylight. we got to go fishing. Let's do this. So I put it in drive. I pull it forward, and then I, sure enough, I hit it in reverse, and I hit it as hard as I can, and I, bam, hit the brakes, and the boat goes sailing off into the middle of the lake. Meanwhile, there are two teenagers standing on the dock in swim trunks, no shorts, laughing at me and doing nothing. And I kind of look at them going, you guys are equipped, let's do this. Like, <laughs> and they don't say a word, they just kind of stare at me and go, like just kind of, you can just see the incredulousness in their eyes, right? I gotta go get my boat. So I strip down to my skivvies. I'm not kidding you. I jump in the lake and I start swimming to go get my boat. Now, I know my wife's perspective now that this is all over, okay? And at this point, as I'm fishing out to go get my boat, my wife goes, oh, there's somebody fishing in the lake. I wonder who that is. And as she's walking towards the dock, she goes, oh, that's Rob's boat out in the middle of the lake. The, the lake. Wait a minute, where's Rob? And then I climb into the boat. She goes, oh, there's Rob. She goes, wait a minute, where are his clothes? And at that point, she, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think there was one point where she's like going, Lord, please don't let that be my husband. Please don't let that be my husband. Please don't let that be my husband. And sure enough, as the boat got closer and I was standing like Captain Morgan driving towards her in just my underwear, she realized she married so far down. So far down. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say stupid things. You're going to do stupid things. There are going to be times where you, where you mess up when it t comes to sharing the love of Jesus with other people. But you know, what's, you know what's awesome? God's greater than your mistakes. Amen? And as much as it may be scary to share your faith with somebody, it's awesome that you have a God that's right there with you. What did Jesus say at the end of, the, at the, end of uh, the Great Commission? And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. So, if we're going to fish, we're going to have to get uncomfortable. But then number two, we're going to have to own the fact that we're going to make mistakes. And then lastly, and this may be a little discouraged, to, even more discouraging to some of us, lastly, the fish aren't always biting. 
They're not. As a matter of fact, there are going to be times where you go to plant a seed or you go to share the gospel or you go to share your faith and people are going to give you a blank stare and it's going to be even more uncomfortable than it was for you to even start sharing the love of Jesus with somebody. It just is. It's a fact. It's not easy. It's something where you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. It's going to take some courage. Everybody say courage. My son and I are reading a book together right now called uh, Do Hard Things, and it has one of my favorite quotes ever in it. It says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the willingness to overcome it. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Not the ability to overcome it. The willingness. In other words, it has to be in you to do a will outside of yourself. In other words, it's going to come from effort, not ability or skill. But the fish aren't always going to be biting. And that's difficult to hear. However, however, I also read an article this week that I think will be extremely encouraging to us. Listen to what this study says from the Barna Group. Okay, This is an article that I found, and, and this is what the writer writes. They said, in the artist formerly known as Prince's Song, 1999, he alludes to the hope and anticipation of the new millennium. So far, I feel the 2000s have not lived up to the hype of the new millennium that Prince talked about in his song. We've lived through 9-11, the worst recession in recent history, a global pandemic, a racial upheaval, political unrest, soaring inflation, rising interest rates, and now the ongoing threat of COVID and all of its variants. No medical intervention has, been, has inoculated us from the psychic effects of a world in turmoil. But, he says this, Americans seem open to a different antidote to help make sense of life in these chaotic times. In October of 2022, Barna survey, uh, a, a, in an October 2022 Barna survey of 2,000 U.S. adults, three out of four, 74% of people say that they want to grow spiritually. We're talking Christians and non-Christians. Additionally, the same proportion say they, have a high, they believe in a higher power. Nearly half say they're more open to God than they were before the, the pandemic. In other words, that pandemic that we all thought was so horrible and awful, God's using and redeeming for his grace and kingdom. Amen? How cool is that? We thought that thing was miserable. How many of you are like, I don't want to see another mask for the rest of my life, right? Barna's been tracking the state of Christianity for nearly four decades, through, though the trajectory of Christian commitment in the U.S. has been on a downward slide and is in need of urgent interventions. In other words, church attendance, biblical obedience, biblical practices. Despite the fact that those are on decline, our new data gives Christian leaders cause for hope. Overall, 80% of Americans say they think there is a spiritual or supernatural dimension to this world. 80%, y'all. Though religious affiliation and church attendance continue to decline, spiritual openness and curiosity are on the rise across every generation, in fact. Every generation, we see an unprecedented desire to grow spiritually, a belief in a spiritual or supernatural dimension, and a belief in God or a higher power. People are more spiritually curious today than they have been in the last few decades, church. Translation, the fish are probably going to bite. People are looking for something. And we know what it is they're looking for, don't we? We know what it is they need, and it's time that we start serving it up, and it's time that we stop keeping it to ourselves. Amen. When you go fishing, man, it can get really discouraging. It can get really uncomfortable. You're going to make mistakes. The fish aren't always going to bite. Oh, I can't tell you how many days I've gone out to the same lake with the same spot and the same gear and not get a single thing compared to the day before. But can I tell you something? When you pull that fish into the boat, man, there is awesome excitement and blessing in it. And the best part is about fishing is once you catch one, you get to go catch another one. It's not like hunting, right? Like, like when it comes to deer hunting, like you get one unless you got extra tags, right? Fishing, you can catch one, you can go get another one, you can go get another one, you can go get another one. 
This week, as a matter of fact, I've had a kid that I've been mentoring for quite some time, and he's been steeped, steeped, steeped into addiction. And I've been trying to mentor him and be there for him and be a, be a part of his life and encourage him, uh, despite the fact that he keeps going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And this week, he's getting ready to go back to treatment, and he said, and I, I called him, and I said, hey, man, how are things going? Let me talk to you. He's in the hospital, and, and he goes, Rob, things are going really good. And that's like the first time he's ever said that to me, and I'm not kidding you. Usually he's unsure, or he's not doing great, or he's struggling, he's like, Rob, things are really good. And I said, what's going on, man? He's like, bro, the other night I finally just dropped to my knees and surrendered it all to Jesus. Can we praise God for that this morning? Now, now, now I'll be honest with you, my pessimistic side sitting here going, man, I hope it sticks. Right? But let me tell you the blessing there was when he said those words to me, because I didn't teach him to drop to his knees. <laughs> I didn't tell him to do that. I, I had an opportunity where I, I, I shared the gospel with him and told him about surrendering his life, but, but the Holy Spirit very clearly just told him, it's time to give up control. It's time to stop trying to do it on your own. It's time to hand the keys over to me. And my prayer, and, and I would like for you to pray, you don't need to know his name, will you just pray for him? that the Spirit would move in and through him to really get a hold of his life this time? Because there's blessing in following Jesus and there's blessing in sharing that blessing with others. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. And you're like, well, yeah, Rob, you're a pastor. No, we're all pastors. We're all Christians. We're all supposed to be fishers of Men. Jesus sent out as many disciples as he could. It wasn't just about the 12, he sent out the 72. And he didn't expect the 72 to be the only ones. And when people got healed by Jesus, when people were healed by the disciples, when people understood and finally were baptized in Jesus' name, in every account, almost every single account throughout Scripture, they left and went and told their friends, Church, it's time to go tell our friends. Amen? We understand what it, that God has a plan for our lives. We understand what radical obedience is. We understand that we need to step into repentance. Now it's time for us to start sharing it with others. Now, over the next year, my goal is to give you more tips and tricks on how to share the gospel with others, especially as we work through the book of Matthew, okay? There are going to be a number of times where we're going to come up against opportunities where Jesus sent out the 72 or sent out his disciples to go minister to others, and we're going to give you ways and try to educate you on how to share your faith with, uh, in Jesus with others, but this week, I would just want to give you something to get you started, okay? This week, um, I want you to be thinking about Easter. Everybody say Easter. Okay. okay, Easter's coming up in just a few weeks, and I don't know if you know this, but people are 80% more likely to say yes to go to an Easter service than they are any other service throughout the year. Did you know that? 80% more likely. And so this is what I want to do. This week, I'm going to give you something simple. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a bobber and a worm, Okay? I'm going to give you a bobber and a worm. I'm going to give you something really simple that you can do to help people come to know Jesus as their Savior, okay? This is what I want you to do. I want you to invest and invite somebody to church on Easter this, Sunday, this, this year. I want this to be the biggest Easter we've ever had throughout history. Not because I'm looking for big numbers as your pastor, but because there are people in Charles City and Floyd County that are on the highway to hell, to use the term, okay? And Jesus wants to take them off of that highway, he wants to get them off of that wide road and through the narrow gate to know him and his light and his faith, okay? Now, here's the good news. Tomorrow night, everybody say tomorrow night. I'm making you talk a lot today. I'm making you talk a lot today. I'm sorry. Tomorrow night, we've got a worship night that we want you to show up to. Pastor Tim Purcell is going to be preaching a message. It's going to be phenomenal. And the whole theme of the night is gospel urgency. Gospel urgency. This idea that, man, there are people that have the Mack truck of hell bearing down on them, and we are God's plan A to get them to know who Christ is. And tomorrow night's going to be all about inspiring people, inspiring people to know who Jesus is. We're going to be praying for our community, we're going to be praying for our schools, and we're going to be praying that God would make an impact on our community through this church. Does that sound good to you guys? So, Invest and invite. Use a bobber and a worm. Keep it simple and know that God has something he wants to do in and through you. I went to a conference this week on Tuesday. It was this church leadership conference. And one of my favorite quotes from a pastor in Chicago by the name of Bill Hybels is this. He says, the church 
is the hope of the world. He says that all the time. His whole ministry was defined by that phrase. The church is the hope of the world. And then this guy named Chris Hodges that um, we were sitting under the teaching of on Tuesday said, I don't believe that the church is the hope of the world. And I was like, wait a minute, what? And then he said this. He said, the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. We aren't the hope if we keep it to ourselves. You hear me, church? We aren't the hope if we're not doing everything we can to help others know his love and his grace and his peace and his truth. So who are you inviting this Easter to come to church? Don't be coming to church with no friend that knows Jesus, that don't know Jesus. You got me? I'll tell you what. I'm... I'm going to invite a friend that I know that doesn't know Jesus to church. I'm going to have my friend with me. Who are you going to have with you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to fish. We thank you for the fact that you got us to bite, God, and that we are living better lives than we ever could have on our own, Father. In this moment, we just want to we lift up the pra- our praises to you. We want to um, see your kingdom come here on earth and your will be done as on earth as it is in heaven, Father. And we just thank you for the fact that your kingdom is so much greater than any kingdom we could ever build on our own, Lord. So we just... We love you, and we ask that you would give us a gospel impact and an urgency to know the importance of what it means to share your love and grace and peace with others, Father. May we be fishermen that cast lines, that throw out the nets. Don't let us stand on the dock and do nothing. Help us to be used by you for your grace and your glory and your kingdom forever and ever. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. And all God's people said... Amen. Would you stand and sing?